Hello everyone and a warm welcome from Athens. It is a pity, of course, that we're not in the Hilton Hotel and uh, just uh, finishing lunch with uh, 350 people uh, enjoying each other's company. But uh, here we are with our virtual event uh, this year and we're extremely happy uh, for the connectivity that we have and that we can all be together on this session. This is session number three. Uh, the title is Finance in a Time of COVID and Uncertainty. Uh, and our moderator today is Mr. Chris Bartsky of Stevenson Harwood here in Greece. Uh, just a couple of ground rules before we start. All guests will be on mute during the discussion to ensure quality control. During the discussion, you can send in your questions in a box shown now on your screen. Uh, these questions will come to me and I will ask some of them at the end on your behalf. Uh, to collapse the window in order to see the whole screen, just use the arrow at the top. I'd like also to uh, thank uh, our sponsors, our corporate sponsors and our prime sponsors. Um, their logos uh, you can see on the screen and uh, you'll be able to see uh, throughout the day. So uh, welcome to everybody and I'll now pass the floor over to uh, Chris. Chris, please. Thank you, Kevin. Um, thank everybody for attending. As Kevin said, it would be much nicer to have the direct contact of an of a actual conference at Hilton, but we will try to discuss a very hot topic uh, today. Um, when Kevin and I were dis discussing the nature of our topic, uh, I, did, I did believe that covering COVID and how this has affected world economy, and in particular banking and shipping finance, was something of paramount importance taking into consideration that we're all active in shipping and this is a marine money uh, conference. Um, so the outbreak of COVID-19 has, has had a detrimental effect on the global economy, resulting uh, in dramatic uh, decrease of growth and the impact on shipping and finance has been uh, quite substantial. This is going to be the topic that we're going to cover today and I will let my uh, distinguished panel members to introduce, briefly introduce themselves, and then we shall kick off with the, the, our discussion. I will ask Robertus to introduce himself first. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Robertus uh, Kroll. I'm in ING's uh, shipping finance team, uh, which consists of 30 uh, profession professionals uh, globally. I'm based in London, and I've been the team uh, for over 15 years now. Uh, my main focus is on the European uh, shipping clients and obviously the Greek markets. Uh, Greek market is very important for us. Um, at the moment, our Greek portfolio is in the $2 billion to $3 billion uh, range. So we are a substantial player. Um, ING has been in ship finance for over 50 years, so we are a long-term player as well. Thank you, Robertus. Uh, could Wisner uh, uh, introduce himself as well? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Wijnand Botman. I'm a managing director at Direct Ship Finance. I've worked in banking since 2007 and in ship finance since 2010, first at NIBC Bank and later at DVB Bank. Uh, with Direct Ship Finance, we are part of a larger Dutch asset manager, which has a strategic focus on bank disintermediation. Um, that means that we are not a bank, but we provide bank-style senior secured loans to the international shipping industry from committed institutional capital. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Dinos, would you be so kind to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank Marine Money for the kind invitation to participate in this virtual forum. I'm Dinos Petropoulos, General Manager at Pireos Bank, responsible for shipping and structured finance. I've been with Pireos Bank uh, since 2013 and have over 30 years of experience in banking in Greece and abroad. Pireos Bank has a long presence in shipping finance, offering a wide range of uh, financial services to Greek shipping companies. Our portfolio currently stands at 2.3 billion US dollar. I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Finance in a time of COVID is indeed a very interesting subject. Pireos Bank takes pride in being responsive and supportive of our clients across all affected sectors of the economy since the very beginning of, of the pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Dinos Vasilis. You're next. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Vasilis Theofanopoulos. I'm a senior director of uh, Mount Street Group. 
Um, I had uh, credit and advisor for Greece and Cyprus. Um, Mount Street is a, a, the largest European independent um, credit asset manager and servicer. We have around eight awarded about 85 billion of uh, CRE, shipping, aviation, loans across the spectrum. In shipping, we have 25 colleagues out of London, Germany, and Athens. Um, and we are working with an 8 billion shipping uh, portfolio uh, coming out of primarily German banks, but in Greece, we are the primary servicer for the NEMO portfolio uh, that uh, Pireus Bank has uh, sold uh, last year. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Vasilis. Katerina? There is a problem with the audio. We cannot, we cannot hear you, Katerina. Well, if Marine Money organizers would, would like to look into that, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Vatis. I'm a partner at Stevenson Harwood. I'm an asset finance specialist with focus on financing of all types of commercial vessels. Uh, and I mainly work with all international and domestic um, banks and financial Good institutions. Good afternoon to me as well. Thank you, um, thank you uh, to Marie Mani for um, participating. Okay, there's an um, overlap here. Can you hear me? Is this better? Yes, let me let me complete my introduction, Katerina, and then you can you can you can continue okay. because we had some issues with your audio. Uh, so SH is a law firm with over 1,100 people worldwide, better. more than 180 partners Hello? with offices in Asia, um, Paris, Dubai, and Piraeus, of course. And now I will let Katerina to introduce herself in order to complete that that uh, part of our discussion. Katerina, can you hear us now? Yes, I think we can hear you now. Hello? Yes, yes. Hello, can I be heard now? There is a delay and your reception is a bit patchy. Can you please start off again? We do apologize for this. Yes, and I apologize for that. <laughs> Internet connections uh, is not helping us. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm Katerina Stafopoulou, Executive Director of Investments and Finance, a shipping finance investment banking advisory boutique. I've been with uh, Investments and Finance since uh, for the past 20 years. And in my previous life, I've always, um, I've also worked for um, banks and a shipping company in the uh, as um, head of shipping finance in the banks having started off with shipping portfolios and as a cfo in a large greek shipping company as my professional life in shipping started in the mid 80s thank you very much thank you very much katarina so let's kick off now with um, with um, um, our discussion uh, I did briefly cover that the outbreak of COVID-19 has had a detrimental effect on global economy. So what we will try to explore now with our, my distinguished panelists is how this impact uh, has affected banking and in particular ship finance. Uh, we do talk about quite often about supply and demand imbalance. Uh, and we, we will try to explore uh, first uh, what are what the main pandemic related parameters are which affect such imbalance how do you see this imbalance being affected by the covid pandemic i would like to extend this first question to vasilis first and then to robertus so we get both perspectives vasili you would like to start yeah thank you um i think uh supply and demand have always uh, fluctuated and then obviously in the last few years we have seen 
the exit of the num or reduction in the portfolios of a number of lenders, uh, traditional lenders into shipping. Uh, Nordic banks have reduced portfolios. Um, ABN AMRO announced uh, what they announced. Uh, the Greek banks have come back into the, the sector, uh, but I think they filled some of their um, uh, uh, slots um, uh, in, over the last couple of years. Um, German banks have for us obviously been a very interesting space where a number of them have uh, reduced um, exposure. So it's, um, it is an overall feeling that there is lower supply into the market from the traditional segments in Europe. Uh, obviously there are, and this is a theme for the last, uh, as far as I can remember, 10 years in the sector. Um, and uh, the presence or not of uh, private credit um, suppliers is kind of what moved the needle. And uh, obviously Chinese lead or um, other Asian uh, providers are also coming in. Uh, I think the pandemic uh, has affected city finance. As we, as we would expect, things have gotten more difficult to execute in, more, in many situations. Uh, some institutions that were there uh, are facing issues in other parts of the portfolio, aviation, obviously, and, and a few others. And uh, of course, this creates some opportunity for alternative lenders, which many of our customers are that, uh, to come in and just pick up some volume. Uh, there is increased interest uh, from new lenders in the space, uh, US lenders uh, as well as Asian lenders. Uh, so we, this is an interesting time. Our team in London closed a transaction, I think you know that Chris, uh, in May and during the kind of the brunt of the pandemic and that was kind of satisfying and we're looking to do more. Thank you very much, Vasily. Uh, Robertus, can we have the perspective of a, of a traditional lender on this point as well? Yes, I um, and, and thank you, Chris. Um, you know, I think from a traditional um, lender's perspective, the, the current approach is, is, is very conservative and, 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 and careful. I mean, um, since the crisis started, um, we have seen a lot of um, short-term volatility and imbalances, you know, both positive and negative, uh, but, but mainly short-term. Look at the, the Bulka market, it was on its knees following the Chinese uh, lockdown and then it recovered substantially. And the tanker market uh, went to uh, very high levels following uh, the, the floating storage demand and is now at very low rates. So um, where we are at the moment is I think that we have to see what's going uh, to happen going forward and what the structural uh, medium term market uh, fundamentals uh, will be. Um, and yeah, you know, demand, um, uh, demand is, uh, is important here. Uh, you know, the supply side for shipping looks, from our perspective, fine. The order book is not too high. Uh, there are not too many orders. Uh, owners are perhaps reluctant because of the market outlook, uh, because of technological uncertainty, etc. So uh, the, the big uncertainty will uh, come in the coming uh, months, the coming year, uh, from the demand side. How are we going to uh, recover? And, and as long as that uncertainty is, uh, is there, I think that the traditional banks will, will remain uh, very conservative and it will definitely be focused on what they have been focused uh, on, on before, if, uh, if not less. Um, I think the good news for shipping, of course, is that um, you know, we are used to volatility and downturns. So I think you know, shipping companies went into this downturn much uh, better prepared than a lot of other industries, let's say that way. And I think, of course, that is something that is noted also with the larger financial institutions that the shipping has been more resilient so far than, than a lot of other industries uh, which run trouble. Thank you very much, Roberto. I think your last comment uh, helps me to go to move on to my next question, which I would like to extend to Dinos and yourself as well, being the only representatives of traditional lenders. Uh, Dino, how do you see traditional banking lending responding to the COVID pandemic? Um, and you know, given the fact that we have a privilege having a representative of, a, of one of the four systemic Greek banks, how does your bank respond under the circumstances? That you know, we would like to get your insight on this. Sure. Well, the first reaction was that of a shock for all shipping lenders. The memories from the crisis in 2016 
were not that distant. After all, there's hardly any precedent of a disruption of such scale in world trade uh, during peacetime. In the beginning, the shipping units within banks were at the epicenter of the crisis, feeling most of the pressure. Our shipping was uh, the first industry to experience the devastating effects of the pandemic. By the mid of the second quarter in 2020, uh, Western economies began entering lockdown mode one after the other, and the crisis spread out to the rest of the economy, affecting, affecting lending portfolios horizontally. Because of the situation, some traditional lenders slowed down their financing activities in shipping, others firmed their exit plans. No doubt, this came as a further detriment uh, to the demand, supply and balance for shipping finance. Uh, Pineos Bank had a, a more sober response to the pandemic. We took a view that the crisis uh, uh, would be temporary and world economies would recover aided by sizable stimulus packages. At the same time, order book remained at historically low levels, creating favorable supply demand fundamentals in the middle term. Therefore, we took a rather strategic decision to, to increase our monitoring of the portfolio on one hand but remain committed to the sector and even expand our clientele portfolio basis, portfolio further, always on a very selective basis uh, and in a careful manner. That's very positive. That's a very positive message for the Greek market. Robertus, how about your bank? Uh, well, I think in, in general what we have seen, uh, and, and of course every bank is in, in a very different position during this crisis, but in, in general I, I think banks have mainly focused on supporting existing clients, and this is the same for ING. This is also what we did after the financial crisis. Um, it's also essential in, in, in shipping to support your clients through the cycles, and this is obviously in a way unprecedented, that uh, perhaps the volatility we have seen is, is not unprecedented in shipping and clients expect us to be there for them. So um, that's what uh, we have been doing and I think a lot of other banks have been doing. And that means, of course, that in general, it's more difficult to find new banks. You know, you have to rely on the existing relationships these days and it will be very difficult to find additional traditional banks under the current circumstances. Um, then again, every bank, as I said, is different. Um, what we have seen is that some banks have uh, also increased the focus on their home markets uh, with or without government support. We have all seen um, uh, the schemes that uh, certain governments have put in place to support local uh, businesses. This is, this is potentially or uh, has, has been a challenge for shipping, how to benefit from this, because shipping is international business and it, can't, it cannot in all circumstances be linked to a home country. So, there you have to be careful that we're not uh, falling through the through the cracks and, and you know are not benefiting in the same way as, as companies that are very much active in certain home markets or certain countries when it comes to government support. Um, I think the crisis so far, and that's a bit further uh, to what I said earlier, has uh, contributed even more to a split ship finance market. Um, banks became more conservative, so even more than Previously, larger owners with substantial balance sheets, uh, which are the, the type of owners that, 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 that suit the, 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 the models of the large banks, where all those will continue to have access to, to competitive traditional bank funding. Um, I think the smaller owners may have to go an uh, alternative route. Um, and, and finally, uh, an important point uh, also for ING, I, I think the crisis has further accelerated the focus on sustainability and, uh, and environmental issues. Um, you know, um, businesses have reassessed and then refocused. Uh, um, and that's not different from all of us, I think. You know, we, we all uh, uh, had considerations during this crisis, what's the new normal, et cetera, what's uh, more important going forward, what's less important. And I think, uh, you know, within a lot of banks, the, 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 the sustainability angle has further accelerated where it was already important. Um, you know, as ING, we are a Poseidon principal signatory and. Uh, Sustainability is most important to us and, and, and our stakeholders, and that includes the client. Thank you very much, Robertus. I think Vasilis touched on that when he when we discussed the first topic. Uh, we do see the emergence of alternative sources of financing, like funds, platforms, um, you know, private equity, etc. Uh, I would like to get Vasilis and uh, Visnard uh, perspective in respect of um, you know non banks and how. Uh, how COVID pandemic has impacted on the lending capacity of such financial institutions. How have these institutions been responding to the pandemic? Vasily, would you be so kind to 
to give your insight on this? Yes, by all means. My sense is that uh, their uh, lending capacity has not is not materially affected. I think it's the appetite for, for the specific uh, types of deals uh, that is getting affected. Uh, I think there is a lot of people see this as an opportunity. Um, they want the same, more or less similar things that that, that the traditional lender might want in a, in a way that you know they want to be doing uh, business with a diversified. Uh, uh, group of people, and they want, but they also want to build relationships and be able to scale them up if they are successful and they are comfortable with the counterparty. So um, I think it, the, the, the difficulty in the in, in this current environment is that building new relationships, especially if you are a new player in that market, is difficult to achieve over Zoom, uh, and uh, trust is also very much more difficult to, to, to build over Zoom. So it, the reality is, the practicalities of it is that people want to deepen the existing relationship. And um, for those that are just entering, uh, they want the first couple of deals to count and they, they probably are going to have less risk appetite. Uh, so they're going to be very selective. That's a fair observation. Uh, Viznant, what's your view on this? Well, I think I think in, in general, as as Robert has already said, it's important to distinguish between uh, you have on the one hand you have the, the larger ship owners, the corporate ship owners, and on the other hand you have the, the smaller and medium size. And I think this answer depends on who, who is asking it. Um, I think in general, as as banks are uh, are stepping out or are reducing their their exposure, uh, that is in particular true for the smaller and medium sized owners. And as a result of which uh, we have seen uh, interest margins increasing a bit and they are now converging to a point that make it attractive for more and more non-bank lenders to step in. And therefore, I think in general, uh, we expect uh, the supply of non-bank lending capacity to increase. Um, if I talk about direct ship finance uh, for us, I mean, on the one hand, we do see uh, an increasing number of loan requests coming to us since, uh, since COVID uh, emerged. Um, our approach to these requests has not uh, has not changed. Uh, as fundamentally, we don't think that uh, the chip finance today is much riskier than it was pre-COVID, uh, as long as you stick to your lending principles. And that's probably a, a bit in line as what, what Dino said, as we also don't think that it will uh, cause for, for structural uh, changes in, in the risk profile of, uh, of chip finance. Um, simultaneously, for example, if you look at, at, at dry book, uh, shipping earnings, values, they have held up remarkably well. Uh, you know, of course, most segments, uh, the performance is much better and uh, supply and demand is much better in balance than it was during previous crisis, uh, like 10 years ago. Um, and if I look at, at, at the funding side of, of a non-bank lender, um, our funding comes from institutional investors, so, so not, um, as with banks, from, from consumer savings mostly. Um, and institutional investors, they specifically consider a risk and return profile for each asset allocation that they make. Um, I think these strategic allocations are typically made for the long term. It's not something that they do for, for, for temporary circumstances. Um, so um, I don't think that, uh, that, that the supply in that sense will, uh, this, uh, will, will, will change because, because we don't see the, the pandemic as a structural thing. Um, what we do experience is uh, that it takes longer or it, uh, it has become uh, more cumbersome to onboard new investors as their due diligence trajectories have increased, have lengthened. Um, and that's generally true because of the, the current uh, environment, which is more volatile, many uncertainties. And I think one of the main challenges in the supply of money, if, if it comes to it, is, is, is also uh, are practical things. For example, the, uh, uh, not being able to travel to, uh, to new clients. Uh, and that's typically something that you want to do, especially if you want to establish new relationships. But uh, in general, I think um, for, for non-bank lenders, the supply is not an, uh, not an issue. Thank you very much. Um, Katrina, you've been in the, in the market for a considerable time now. Uh, can you see a specific trend being followed you know, post-COVID and what impact this will have on the demand for loans from banks and financial institutions? Can you see a trend appearing so far? Well, um... I don't think it's a different trend than what it always was. Can you hear me correctly? Am I being heard? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't you. think uh, the trend for um, capital uh, has changed. 
Shipping is a capital intensive industry. It is also a, relate, a heavily relationship uh, based industry. So I will agree with all the previous speakers that the COVID era has made this a little bit more challenging in order to meet up and discuss uh, projects and possible issues that need to be resolved. They're always better resolved on a face-to-face -face than over Zoom, but we are all adapting to that. Now, as far as a trend in demand for loans, um, I think it, all, it, it was there, it is there, and it will continue being there because shipping being cyclical and um, supply and demand uh, being where it is today, demand is always there. Owners as entrepreneurs need to increase their business, so they need to reach out for um, finance money and not just finance their uh, investments all equity. Now, demand is there, but it needs to be balanced with the supply side of the money. And that, as everybody said, is now more conservative and more restricted. Uh, on the on the non-banking availability, I think pricing is a big issue, and um, yes, margins have changed, but not significantly to match the requests of alternative financiers' funds and what they are requesting, because banks, their business is to make money from money. Uh, the the alternative um, and they have a different return profile on this investment and on their risk allocation. The alternative financiers, because as uh, Winan said, there are investors behind that, they have a different A, risk profile and B, tenor profile and C, return profile. So they're investors like our entrepreneurs are and they're looking for a high return. So pricing, is a big issue and that's what makes um, finding finance challenging. If, um, yes, your existing relationships are very important, but your existing relationship has also a limited capacity right now, possibly, so you need to reach out to new relationships and that has been challenging irrespective of COVID. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, you have rightly spotted that pricing is one of the major parameters when one, you know, uh, goes through different term sheets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would like to explore with Vasily and Robertus, um, because they do have that experience, how the structures of loans, including pricing, which is very important for the majority of the ship owners, has been influenced due to the COVID pandemic and the resulting uncertainty. Vasily, uh, Robertus first. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, I think in general, structures became more conservative. Um, you've seen lower leverage, shorter tenor, shorter repayment profiles. Not sure if so much changed for ING, because I think we have always been on the on the conservative side of the of the range, and then our clients are you know conservative too. They, they want to be conservative to absorb volatility going forward. So. I think they are fine what we have been offering and what we are offering now. But I think um, across um, across the board, uh, general banks have uh, um, offered a more conservative um, structures. Um, and I think and this is true for ING, but I think and I can imagine it's true for a lot of other traditional banks that, that we prefer to be competitive in respect of pricing uh, rather than structure. So uh, in that order, you know. Uh, that is definitely a bit of all the uncertainty around where we are. The structure has to be right, has to tick the boxes, and then you know the pricing is, is then then a second discussion where we perhaps can find the, the balance. But no, uh, um, not so many different or changes to the to the structures. Um, pricing um, at the beginning of the crisis, margins uh, slightly increased. Um, bank funding costs uh, went up uh, following the yeah, increased uncertainty again. I think six six months later, we are looking at a more stable outlook, pricing outlook, but the pricing remains above um, uh, pre uh, pre COVID levels. Um, yeah, what I would like to say is, I think still most important is to secure your funds, right? And I don't think we are in an environment whereby you should uh, uh, spend too long on the last ten or twenty basis points of the margin. I mean, securing funds should be the first priority. And 
you know, interest rates in general are low, right? So if you look at all in funding costs uh, of companies, it's not it's not too bad. Thank you very much, Robertus. Vasily, what's your insight on this, based on your experience and exposure? Well, I think over the last few years, I, I think the, the the main parameter affecting the market on, on that front is the, the need for European lenders to take a much more a restrictive approach in a number of areas, including you know, the leverage, the tenure, um, the pricing that they need to, um, uh, they need to have. Uh, and, and that kind of is, is a one-way street, I think, with just regulation. Um, if, if you move away from the traditional European bank, um, uh, I think then you can find more or less anything, but in combinations that make sense for the uh, investors on the other side, uh, and I've seen a bit on the on, on the border side as well. And I know it can be frustrating when you step out of your comfort zone um, and and have to face the new realities of uh, financing. At the same on the same on the same side, though, you can find more or less what you're looking for if you if you have enough conversations out there. So you can find uh, lenders that can go out the the age curve. Uh, like we, we actually like uh, to go in that area um, in older vessels, in traditional segments. Uh, you can find lenders that are comfortable with a higher uh, level, the LTV. Uh, obviously, uh, that is going to have price implications. Uh, you can find lenders that are motivated for specific nationality or, or specific use or kind of having a more than one relationship with the, with the vessel. Um, you know, Cargill is using its balance sheet right now to um, to its own benefit um, uh, to, to to help finance vessels for for some of these um, counterparties. Uh, so you can find what you're looking for. It's just there is an efficient frontier, and, and the market is finding it fast. Thank you very much, Vasily. Uh, we were talking about, we we're talking about the pandemic and how this has been influencing uh, world economy, banking, and ship finance uh, by extension. Uh, I'm sure that you know financial institutions, including banks and non-banks, um, have deployed certain uh, plans in order to um, to use mitigants. Um, for new lending, in order to in order to address the the resulting uncertainties, do you know what are the mitigants that you have been employing during the COVID period, era in order to address this uncertainty as Piraeus Bank? And then I would like to extend that uh, uh, question to Kat, to, Kater, to Katerina Evisnard as well. Well, I believe it has already been mentioned by the other speakers. In order to cope with the uncertainty and volatility. We have taken also a more conservative view in terms of LTV ratios for new lending in combination with uh, mechanisms that seek to smooth out temporary cash flow disruptions. One such mechanism is the use of debt service reserve accounts. They have always been there, but you know now we have come to appreciate them more in time of volatility. New borrowers are asked, for example, to prefund such an account with a reserve set aside for future debt payments in case of a shortfall in operating cash flows. Such an account functions as a buffer, gives the lender and the borrower enough time to sort out uh, the situation. An alternative mechanisms we have employed uh, is the use of pre-approved deferral options or the, maybe the backloading of principal installments. But you know, aside of uh, structural enhancements, the most important mitigant is the presence of a committed sponsor that has demonstrated experience in dealing with market disruption in the past as well the proven capacity and will to step in with additional equity support when needed. Thank you very much. Uh, Katerina, Vizno, do you have anything else to add? Well, actually, Dinos uh, has covered it all very beautifully from what we see from our clients and across the uh, finance or money market availability for shipping finance and our capacity as advisors. The uh, mitigants, yes, they are as Dino said, which increase the liquidity reserves. And um, we are very happy to see that structures that look forward to anticipating um, restructuring uh, type of um, issues are already implemented from day one. 
And of course, here the bottom line is the relationship and the experience of the borrower, of the owner, of the principal, and his commitment to shipping. Because shipping cycles and difficulties are something that shipping knows very well. And the experienced owners have gone through other crises as well and have proven their ability to charter the vessel, keep it employed as much as possible, and also as much as possible put their money where their mouth is, if I'm allowed the expression, when times are difficult. But this should always, and at this point in time we've seen, should be done hand in hand with the bank. So everybody shares pain in the difficult times to weather out the storm and come out on the sunny side after the hurricane. And um, so mitigants are on both sides of the structure. May I be allowed to say something on uh, the pricey question that we addressed before? I agree with Robertus. It should not be um, focusing on the last uh, leaps or whatever of the margin. However, pricing does play a big role when you have to structure and look at the break-even levels. So that plays a big role as well. And yes, we should be focusing on finding the money, but then also making the loan sustainable. So it's keeping a balance among all the constituents and the terms of the loan. So pricing is one thing, but it's covenants, it's extra liquidity that is being asked to be put up front or on the side to weather out a difficult situation. And um, a lot of stricter covenants on the financial side as well, on the companies. But yes, I agree, we should be focusing on finding the money, but then the structure should be viable and sustainable. And that's where the tricky part starts. Thank you. I think a couple of things there, Chris. I mean, uh, as, as was said earlier, shipping earnings and values are relatively holding well in general. And the, the key uh, question is indeed the uncertainty. And it's not only triggered by the COVID, but also by the upcoming U.S. elections, uh, the U.S.-China trade war, Brexit, and, and, and you mentioned it. So the way how, how we deal with it as, as direct ship finance is, and, and I think it's just an underlying general principle of any ship financing, is to incorporate time into your structure. Uh, for example, by uh, not stretching a repayment profile to the maximum uh, on day one, um, but, but ensuring that it can be stretched if needed. Um, what, what we typically do at our direct ship finance is we offer a borrower um, the option to skip one or two quarterly uh, repayments uh, at will. Um, for example, to, to, to deal with uh, more difficult times or when it needs to fund the dry docking or something, uh, something similar like that. And, and the key is not to panic when those type of uh, remedies need to be taken. And what helps to that extent is the fact that we are not a bank. So it's not like whenever we need to make certain amendments to loan, then we instantly need to, to increase our, our capital buffers and make a loan less profitable or so. Um, but but that's, that's what it means. Uh, you, you need to be flexible um, as a lender. Um, then just, just one point also coming back a little bit on, on the pricing point, as, as Katharina mentioned. Um, of course, pricing is important. Um, but I don't think that pricing is the problem. It's indeed the, the break-even rate, which is which is uh, what, what drives a loan. And I think that's also what underlies our underwriting philosophy. We look at cash flow and on the basis of what a certain vessel or vessels can sustain, um, then we structure the, the loan amount around it. And whether that uh, results in a 50 or a 60% loan to value, that's, that's the result of the equation rather than the input. And I also think if you would uh, yeah, get a 50% loan at 3%, or a 60% loan at 5%, the difference may be 2%, but your total cost of capital, if you include the cost of equity, is probably even lower, at, 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 even if you pay a little bit more on the debt. And if, you know, 60% on, on, on one or 2% uh, margin, because that's, I think, the difference nowadays between banks and non-banks, um, if that um, means the difference between a very challenging break-even rate or a very doable break-even rate, then you're probably just taking too much leverage. So. That's how we how we look at it. Thank you very much, Vincent. We were talking about uh, mitigants, and I think um, a related topic is um, restructurings. Uh, what's your view and experience in respect of restructurings uh, that banks and non-banks follow? Uh, you know, policies that they follow during the COVID era. Vincent, uh, would you like to start first, and then uh, Dimas will give his insight uh, from Piraeus Bank as well. Restructurings. 
I'm sorry, Chris, would you like to start? Do you say? Yeah, Vizinant, I would like to start and then followed by Dino. Yeah. Now, look, um, um, I have been through a number of restructurings uh, during my banking days and and I think, um, um, you know, you, you need to take a case by case approach because uh, different situations require different uh, solutions and no restructuring is the same. Um, what, I, what, what is really important is that a ship owner and a, and a lender work together, that they are transparent about the situation. Um, and I think in general for us, uh, we are flexible in the, in, the, in the tools that we can deploy in a restructuring, whether it comes to rescheduling, uh, repayment profiles, waiving of covenants. Uh, but what we do expect is that, that a ship owner puts, puts thought um, and, and, and comes up with constructive ideas and, or an action plan on, on how to act if the situation escalates. Um, it really needs to go hand in hand, just, just blindly asking for a waiver uh, to see whether in one or two quarters time the situation is resolved. I mean, look, if, if it's only a, 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 an immaterial aspect, then, then, then sure, let's, let's talk about it. But we expect to be a team and, uh, and work together on it, and it, that needs to come from both sides. We don't have a set policy on how to, uh, to address a restructuring. Thank you very much. Well, a very similar concerns with uh, Winant. The main policy during the COVID era has been to remain uh, even closer to our customers and understand their challenges and hardships. Uh, a few of our customers have indeed sought to receive uh, some sort of a limited payment relief or waivers on applicable covenants. Uh, in general, we have sought uh, to be accommodative of such requests. In recognition you know, that this has been a, a sector-wide crisis of an unprecedented scale. Such policy has been in line with the guidelines of our supervisors, uh, which were keen to allow banks some flexibility. Relief measures are usually used uh, skeptically by our supervisors uh, as triggers for financial difficulty and may lead to the reclassification of, of a loan as non-performing. Uh, in response to the pandemic, fortunately, regulators decided to relax applicable rules for a limited period that expired the last month so that uh, such measures would not be automatically considered as distressed restructurings. Uh, relief requests uh, such as the granting of a partial uh, principal deferral uh, have been of course carefully considered uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure that the economic viability of the borrower is not being compromised. In all cases, a relief would be conditional to the solid evidence of additional contribution uh, by the sponsor, the introduction of a uh, mechanism such as a cash sweep uh, for the recapturing of deferred amounts uh, and limitation of dividends and so on. Thank you very much, Dinos. Um, I'm very conscious about our time. We have another seven minutes, uh, but I would like to cover two topics and I would like to get the view of all, all, uh, all of you here. Um, we, we have environmental, social and governance regulations which are being imposed on the banking system but not on funds and non-bank non lenders. Uh, Katerina, would you say that this creates a two-tier financing market in an extremely, in an over-regulated banking environment and how do you see that being affected by the pandemic? Although I think that the, the impact of that is far, far more rich in a respect of the pandemic situation or not. Um, in the beginning, I think, yes, once this starts to be uh, implemented, and it is starting to be implemented, I believe it causes a two-tier market, as this is an EU regulation on EU banking, on EU banks, um, who already have other regulations they need to follow, environmental especially. I don't think it has to do with COVID at all, because it actually the EU uh, sustainable finance regulation is there to finance the sustainable growth that will help the EU achieve the 2030 goals and the IMO uh, goals. And what has actually happened is that they made the financial sector, the European financial sector, be part of the solution and um, play a very critical role in achieving the sustainability goals of the EU. Now funds who are not regulated okay, um, are there to extend the loans as, and not be compliant to that. However, our um, experience has shown over the past two months 
that the funds or the alternative financiers are sensitive to this as well. They may not be there to enforce it as much, but they are slowly, at least environmentally, they are there to monitor it or request it. But yes, to answer directly your question, I think this has, uh, this is creating a two-tier financing market for the European banks, because we also have okay. the Asian banks, the funds, the American banks, etc. So it's like the new, when the new environmental um, regulations came in, you know, countries were signing up to it and, um, you know, slowly everybody was accepting, for example, ballast water treatments or other IMO uh, environmental situations. However, the EU, um, the ESG regulation does not only have to do with environment, it has to do with your social and governance um, issues that cover a lot of things that, in my opinion, shipping already has. It just needs to show that it does. For example, uh, if, I, if I'm allowed very quickly, one of the um, social uh, principles that they have to um, cater to is onboard health and safety, uh, CFR's well-being, employee well-being, human rights. And I think shipping has always been, as an industry internationally, and of course Greek shipping, because it is relationship-based, not only outside the company with its financiers or suppliers, but it's relationship-based with its employees and its seafarers. And it's always been sensitive and looking after that. So I think a good part of the ESG factors is something that the shipping industry already does. And slowly, it has to have a mechanism to prove it, which will then assist the banks to lower or rate themselves in a better way and hopefully that will bring down their funding costs. That's the way I read this and I understand it. We have until 2030 to streamline this. And I'm hoping that all financiers will come on board, whether they this is a regulation or it is just a, um, an initiative like Poseidon Principles. Because Poseidon Principles is an initiative um, to help collect the big data on behalf of um, IMO, but ESG regulation is a regulation. It's a directive from the EU. Yeah, thank you, Katerina. Uh, Dino, Vasily, do you have anything else to add to this um, extensive and inclusive uh, position of uh, Katerina? Well, Katerina did cover it uh, uh, very well. Uh, ESG sensitivities are very important. Pireos Bank has embraced the concept of sustainable development very early on and has signed the principles for responsible banking in the framework of UN environmental private finance initiative. ESG regulation in the banking sector is indeed imminent. Recently, the European Bank Association published a consultation paper regarding disclosure requirements for risk related to ESG. So this is coming, a new regulation that will sit on top of existing regulatory setting and uh, this will create indeed a two-tier market, uh, two-tier finance market that will be reflected in a two-tier uh, shipping uh, market uh, in the sense that uh, you know you'll have uh, one group of shipping companies that will be in position to comply with the increasing requirements of banks in terms of reporting, transparency, governance, and thus uh, retain access uh, uh, to the traditional banks and the lower cost of finance. Uh, well, on the other hand, uh, you, know, you will have another group of companies that will be will revert um, to the alternative sources of finance to the extent they will uh, remain uh, less constrained by regulation. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a hypothesis. We don't know how long it will last. Vasily, thank you very much, Dino. I, I, myself, I don't, I, I don't really think that ESG is something either new or changes anything in the market necessarily. Shipping is not new to environmental regulation, it's not new on social regulation, it's not new on governance regulations. Uh, it's just an inexorable slide to watch more regulation in some areas, uh, and that's not just shipping everywhere. Um, in, uh, in, in reality, you have a multi-tier, you have people that find it beneficial quickly to exceed uh, current thresholds uh, that you know, what is allowed to do within your operations and and those people will lead obviously most of the time you will find people in a very complex and, and competitive industry 
that find it beneficial to just meet regulations wherever they they, they are and that's fine as long as uh, we collectively agree that that's fine and 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 there are going to be financiers that are going to back them um usually uh i think large long-term players will want to exceed the minimum and then you're going to have people that are possibly cutting corners and i think that is on its way out as it always has been one last sentence yes. um, uh, what i would like to point out is that esg is not just for shipping Poseidon principles are esg regulation is across all industries it's a regulation on the banking community to make their loan portfolios across all industries compliant with the IMO 2030 um, direction and um, rules so and targets. So shipping as an industry, as of course Dinos and Vasily said, and I said previously, is more prepared towards that direction than other industries. It's just one more thing on top of everything else. But they're, I believe they're more prepared. It's just a more administrative cost to prove that I've been doing this all this time. That it's a cross. Thank you, Katerina. And to conclude, we have talked about um, demand and supply imbalance, uncertainty because of COVID pandemic. We have talked about two tier financing market. Um, do you see the future? How do you see the future positioning of shipping within the broader lending community being affected post COVID pandemic? Do you see shipping is going to change its position within, or rather, uh, the lending community will change its position vis-a-vis -vis shipping uh, post-COVID. Uh, Robertus, what's your um, view? Well, as, as mentioned earlier, you know, shipping has shown uh, amazing resilience uh, during a very big crisis. Again, we are used to volatility, and you know, most probably you're better prepared uh, for this crisis. And, and obviously, that has been uh, noted by by people in, in other industries or covering, covering different industries. Shipping will also always be, um, you know, relevant for world trade. Goods have to be moved. There are a lot of other industries, uh, you know, where the future may uh, be changed forever. We will wait and see, but, you know, shipping's model will most probably remain. Um, there of course, a, a few challenges. Um, um, I, I agree with, with Katerina that in shipping, we do already a lot on the environmental side, sustainability, improvement. But that is not necessarily always the perception of the rest of the world. I think we also have to do a better job there as an industry to show to the broader community that actually we are on, on top of the game, which which we are, but to make sure everybody knows that. And, and, and finally, as I also mentioned previously, shipping is international by nature, doesn't have necessarily one home country. So if we are going into an area whereby there will be a lot of support in home markets from banks or in certain countries from governments, that, that will also be a challenge for shipping. Thank you very much, Robertus. Um, uh, Vithnard, uh, do you have anything to add to this positive message being conveyed by Robertus? No, I can, I can mainly echo what, uh, what Robertus is saying. I mean, we are, we are obviously constantly talking to the institutional investment community, trying to sell shipping loans as an asset class to, uh, to, to convince them to put it into their uh, into their asset mix, and I think the the current crisis is an excellent opportunity for shipping to to to, to show itself and to improve its reputation, and, uh, and therefore uh, hopefully in, in the future it may make it easier for us to uh, to 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 compete with the, the usual suspects of commercial real estate infrastructure and all the other asset classes that they are that they are looking at. So um, yeah, that's. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Katerina, anything else to add on this? So uh, we can no, I'm our... also very positive. I think shipping, uh, COVID has nothing to do with the financing appetite in the shipping industry. Um, I believe there always will be um, appetite for the shipping industry, subject to uh, the conditions, the regulations, and the market equilibrium. So the... Um, when rates and values uh, become better, there will be more appetite. When they are more challenging, they will be more conservative. But this is the cycle that shipping does and shipping finance follows. 
So I'm very positive. I think uh, shipping will always attract uh, money uh, from different sources and possibly from different landscapes because the world is changing. Thank you very much, Katerina. With this positive uh, conclusion, Kevin, I would like to, to ask whether we have any questions for our panel members. Yep, thank you, Chris. There are two or three questions which came in, if I may. I mean, the first question is um, asking if banks today are doing any non-recourse uh, transactions, you know, without a corporate or a personal guarantee, or has basically everything been tightened up and guarantees are required? Uh, Roberto, Robert, please. It was always difficult to comment on, on, on you know, any uh, individual transaction or circumstance, but definitely the direction of travel is towards the uh, corporate structure and more so than it has ever been. Then uh, the question is, uh, yeah, how long will certain structures remain in place? How long will the uh, regulatory environment allow that, etc.? But uh, no doubt that the, the direction of travel is to full uh, corporate recalls. Okay, thank you. There's a question for Dinos. Uh, Dinos, because you're representing uh, a Greek bank. Uh, the question is, uh, it seems that some Greek banks are lending again at uh, sub 3% to small and medium-sized companies. And the question is, how is this profitable, bearing in mind cost of funds and uh, Basel equity restrictions? Well, uh, rest assured that uh, we have a very elaborate uh, pricing models and uh, Every transaction we do, at least at Prios Bank, is uh, profitable and it has to be above the break-even. Uh, but, you know, this is a case-by-case -case, uh, situation. There's no uh, one answer for every, <clears throat> every case. Okay. Thank you. And then a final question, and perhaps you can all touch on it. I mean, earlier on in the discussion, uh, we discussed quite a lot about break-even, and break-even seems to be a, de a key determinant of pricing and terms. And the question is, with such volatility and uh, rate changes in the market, how can uh, a financier take a view on what is going to be break-even over a four- or five-year uh, financing? Uh, Vijant? Um, yeah. Look, I think um, key is not to be distracted by things that may be, that may be short term in nature. Um, for example, um, uh, we have seen the significant increase on the tanker side earlier this year. I mean, and it would be very risky to, to, to take that as a, as a pinpoint for longer term financing as a break even rate. Um, simultaneously, you should probably also not take today's uh, low point in, in, in or, or lower point, like, like we have seen in the tanker market recently, um, as, as a price point. Um, we try to look at what we have seen in the past 10 years, uh, try to take out a bit of the outliers, take the median earnings of the various ship types. Um, we look at the track record of individual owners. What have they been doing? Because we recognize certain owners have specific trading uh, business models. Um, that, that yield uh, certain returns that are not reflected in the overall indices. Um, and then you try to structure your loan around it. Um, if you are currently in a low point in the, in the cycle, you want to do a, a backloaded repayment profile. And if you are in, in a high market, you may want to do a bit additional leverage along a front-loaded repayment profile. But on the longer term, we do expect that the markets revert to a certain more long-term um, uh, value. Yeah, and it's a bit of a judgment call based on based on previous data. Um, I, I think um, we often look at historical rates. You know, nobody knows uh, what's going to happen in the future. Nobody has a crystal ball, but the historical rates are historical rates. So we often have a quick look. Hey, where are we compared to the historical? Average the historical median. Well, you can do this for charter rates. You can also do this for interest rates, uh, etc. I mean, again, everybody has to make uh, their own decision in respect of fixing interest rates or not. Um, but we we have seen owners who said this is the moment to fix interest rates for the longer term because they're lower than historical rates, and then at least I know that it has a positive uh, known contribution to my break even. Thank you, Katerina. If I can ask you, I mean, you you often uh, advise uh, clients on financing. I mean. Would you, in terms of break-even, would you go for a higher loan with perhaps higher pricing or a lower 
loan amount with lower uh, lower pricing? What, how can what kind of advice are you giving people? It uh, can you hear me? Because my 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 video has frozen. Yeah, can we can you hear, hear me. You, Katarina. Yes, good. Um, yeah, we can hear you. What we advise is to be prudent. There are projects, uh, and we are very much sensitive to break-even structuring loans based on break-even and discussing the terms uh, with financiers and our clients, because the loan needs to make sense and be viable and sustainable and each project has its own merits so you can't say across the board you want high leverage or low leverage because it also has to do with the risk appetite of the client and of the financier and the structuring so there are ways to structure and i'm sure all of my friend financiers on the panel because we've worked together and discussed know that you take into consideration all the merits of the project and the vessel and its employment and its prospects. But break-even, focusing on the break-even, is what is makes a viable loan going forward. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball, and we can't say that even under historical terms, eight, for example, an $8,000 per day break-even is comfortable because we've seen the market go lower. But if it's structured in a balanced way, both parties will weather out the long term and the um, uh, bumps in the road going ahead. So we don't advise on any particular leverage. It is all on the merits of each project and client. Perfect. Okay, I'm afraid uh, we're out of time for this uh, session. So uh, Chris, uh, Katarina, Vasily, Dinos, uh, Vijnand and Robertus, thank you very much indeed for joining us thank uh, today. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank you to all of the thank you. coming in. Thank you. Um, our, next, our next session is uh, at uh, three o'clock Greek time um, and the title is Planning New Investments for an Unsettled Future and I hope you can join us. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.